when you go work for a company, there's like a way it's done. And then one day you realize you're like, whoa, we don't have to do it that way. But man, it, it's a t it takes a while to get to that realization. Yeah. It's like we can do whatever we want as long as we're being reasonable. Nowadays, like your focus at HO is... Well, at HO, I mean, I'm a vice president of the company. I'm a brand manager. So I'm responsible for the HO brand because uh, at HO Sports, which is the, the collective company, it's HO and Hyperlite. So my good friend, Tommy Curtin, he's in charge of the Hyperlite brand. And I'm responsible for the HO brand. And what that means, more or less, is to find a way uh, to give a return on investment to our ownership group and to take care of all the people that work there. Make, make, meaning, like, make sure we have money coming in and, and make sure everyone's getting paid and, and make sure we're making And the way we do that is by making great product and, and promoting that product and, and getting that story to the people. But that's a lot of products. So I work on water skis, water ski boots, um, a lot of life vests, knee boards, combo skis, uh, inflatable kayaks, inflatable SUPs, inflatable tubes, all the drop stitch stuff, the rads, the fads. Well, we have to create all that product. Um, we have to market it. And then I do kind of like big account sales as well, like uh, West Coast Reveal or Australia. So that's kind of my main deal is like set the strategy for the brand, um, budget for that and oversee the creation of the product, the promotion of it, the sales of it, get a return on investment and, and keep everybody employed. So water ski though, it's kind of like my passion, right? I'm a skier. And so, and HO, even though we're a big company and we, we do a lot of different things, like very much so water ski centric. Like, I think people don't realize that. Like if you went to a board meeting, they're obviously concerned about all categories, but water ski is really where we all came from. That whole company was founded on water skis and the people there don't forget that. So we probably spend, well, I know we do. We spend more money on development of water ski than any other ski company by a long way. Um, I think people forget that, you know, when you work in a big company, there's pros and cons, but one thing is you have the R and D budget to spend a lot of money. And, and in order to develop skis nowadays, you need the money because it's pretty high level. It's technical. You got to cut a lot of molds. You got to build a lot of test skis. You have to destroy a lot of test skis looking to make something better. And you got a big team. I mean, our, our spend in R and D is, I bet it's, you know, five, 10 X, some other companies. Well, so within that context, explain kind of what this weekend is about and relate that to the expenditure versus potentially some other, you know, some other scenarios where maybe they don't have the opportunity to bring yeah. in 10 or eight. Skiers. Yeah. So you got 10, eight to 10 of the best skiers in the world, uh, syndicate team skiers. We're fortunate to have a team like that. Really what we're doing here is, um, you know, I work with the team to design skis. And then eventually when you get the ski ready for mass production, you release it into the wild. And it is a phenomenal ski. Omega is a great ski. Um, but to be honest, in order to get a guy from running two at 41 to running 41, like you saw Will Asher do at the last pro event, the Malibu Open, you know, they, they're, you need to work on that ski for him. And this is like our giving back to the team, more or less. Hold on a sec. Yeah. Is it buzzing? You can hear that? Well, I didn't really say anything worthwhile anyway. So. No, you did. I just, <laughs> that was like, that, I, all of a sudden I heard a fucking cadence in the background. A goddamn yeah. metronome. Sorry, folks. The clock. Sorry for the cuss words. I know some people don't like that. And the clock was in my ear, and you probably are going to thank me now. So... Where were we? <laughs> this is like giving back to the team. So the team puts a lot of hard work into helping create a ski like the Omega. And then as a result of that hard work or as a benefit to that hard work, then Bob and myself and Marcus and Wade, Will, and kind of the R&D team want to give back to the athletes. So we put them on the skis and we fine tune them for their particular style or needs at their hardest pass. And I think that's why you see a lot of syndicate skiers have a lot of success on the pro tour because uh, they have a guy like Bobble Point watching them ski on their ski and helping adjust it such that it suits what they need. And that's unique. I don't, I, I think that's a special thing. I mean, the amount of 
knowledge and experience that Bob has or Wade has or Will is now kind of created and even and even myself you know I've been doing this a long time there's just a lot of stuff you've learned um, mistakes you've made things you've kind of keyed into things you've put together through the years you can pass on to a, a Benny or a Rob or even a Mateo uh, to help them get to the next level and so we do that with our team um, we try and do it with you know our customers and we really are trying to bring that to everybody you know um, it's just tough you know there's only so many of us I think it's interesting because we have like generations I was looking yesterday cool. we've got yeah. Rob Hazelwood who's Willie's cousin he's 20 years old he's like the current generation of up-and-coming yeah. rippers like he's at 8 a.m. yesterday runs 241 off the dock yeah that's impressive back on you know yeah he was on the Omega now he's back on the pro like he can do it on both of our skis mm -hmm. It's cold. Nobody else is even thinking about skiing. Yeah. <laughs> but then you got Willie, next generation, kind of my generation. And then you've got Wade, who was like, who Will was looking at. Rob was looking at Will. Will was looking at Wade and Andy. And you've got Wade, who was looking at Bob and Chris. Yeah. So, like, we've got kind of a cool scenario. And that's kind of to your point. Maybe you could talk, and we talked earlier offline about, you can do the nuts and bolts. Yeah. You can do all the mechanical stuff develop new skis but that's 90 percent of it or whatever you're saying what's the what do we what does this offer in your opinion above and beyond just the yeah. nuts and bolts well i think i think it's like how do you get a ski from good to great you know and i really think not to knock anything but like it's pretty easy nowadays to make a good ski like there's a lot of good skis on the market if I wanted to start a ski company tomorrow and I was green, I would go pick one out and I'd measure it all up and I'd ride it and say, I like it, but I wanted to do this a little different. I modeled the CAD and it would, it would probably be pretty good, but it's hard to go from a good ski to a great ski. And I think, you know, theorizing on it and having a strategy and having some calculations and is a, is okay. But I really think in my experience, the only way to go from good to great is through, uh, thorough testing with uh, an experienced eye in the boat. And I think LaPointe and Wade and Will are how we get those skis from good to great. Like I can get them close. I can get them, let's say 90% of the way there through, you know, some engineering and some theorizing with you, Marcus, and, you know, talking to people and taking feedback and oh, how much drag do you want? How much engagement here? How do you want the tail to release? I want stability and pitch. But to really take it to the next level, you have to give it to a world-class athlete, have them push it to the absolute limit, and have a guy like Wade Cox or Bob LaPointe in the boat watching that, who's done it himself and felt what that athlete is feeling and has those 40 years or however experience to say, yeah, this is what's going on, and, that, and to have a, a strategy to get it to that next extra couple buoys. And we're unique in that regard. We have a phenomenal team, and we've been fortunate enough to hold this whole thing together. And I think that's because everybody here is really passionate and has a collective goal of trying to push water skiing forward and to figure out if it's possible to go a little bit further for these high-end guys or really to help the average skier improve. Because we all know once you reach a point in tournament water skiing or solemn course skiing in general, it's tough. The progress slows down, and we are really trying to create that product to help you break through. What, that's my goal, you know. What What's the added value in... Because you could have Will and Bob or Will and Wade working together at Will's house in, in Orlando. Wade could be there one day or Bob could be there. And the next day... The next day... My, my dogs, Is that your dog? My dogs are barking. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And the next day you've got Bob over at JT's. And then the next day maybe Bob's over at, at you know... I don't know, Benny's. So you've got, you've kind of got this piecemeal, you know, one-on-one -on -one interaction, but here you've got all the skiers on the same dock and kind of everybody's yeah. melt, melting and blending their ideas and their feedback is what's the added value in that? Is there added value? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, it's the collaboration is huge and, and having that kind of energy when you get all those kind of like legends together, it fires you up. Like, I think the reason Rob Hazelwood's fired up to ski at 8 a.m. is because Bob LaPointe's going to ride in the boat and Wade Cox is driving. I tell you what, he's going to, like, he's an he's a competitor. He, you know, he's going to find another gear and give it a go. And 
when it's touch or go in a four ball at 39, he's going to dig deep, hang on, and make it. When when the point's in the boat, you're like, oh, I better bow up. You know what I mean? Like, so, and then when you get all that kind of energy on the dock, and, you know, they're, these guys are super competitive, so they're all kind of playing off one another, but it's beautiful because they're all cooperative as well. And I think just having the kind of Wade and, and Bob and, and Will kind of set that precedence that, like, hey, this is a group effort. So they're competitive individually, but they're kind of all collectively doing it for the good, the better good. That's a unique thing, and it's a rare moment. I think we got to, like, savor that, and I'm just, like, fortunate to, like, help be in, be in that. And I think it's motivating. I know, like, for me, you know, you run a business, it's kind of not sexy. It's a lot of tough times, but it's, like, these times that make it worth it. You know, I think this is, like, what it's all about, so. Yeah, it's there's a lot of power and a lot of value in getting... Yeah, I mean, we're ski fans, too. To, to get to hang out with your heroes or the current best skiers in the world or the future generation, like, it's cool. I, yeah. Somebody asked me the other day, yesterday, about the graphics and about John Yan. Yeah. You know, he's here taking photos this week, um, but he's also one of the artists that designs the skis. And there's a lot of detail, like on the Omega, for instance. There's yeah. a lot of detail. And they're asking, like, well, who does that? Okay, well, well how much time does he spend? Yeah. Because, oh, I, I don't know who it was. Maybe it was Rob Hazelwood. But we were talking about some other ski brands. and we, I don't need to mention any names, but there's definitely a difference in graphics. And at the end of the day, for the high-end slalom skier, that, that shit doesn't really matter. Like, the, what matters is, does it work? Can I, can I run my best score on sure. it? But if you got a brand who's putting that much effort into the look of the ski, you know, as far as the graphics, does that also spill over into the other ways that you spend money as far as like R and D budget and the amount of, you know, recuts you do on the mold and the, like, are those two tied together? Yeah, I think, I mean, we look at a ski, uh, I mean, a tournament skier looks at it as a tool, um, but we're just, we're just trying to make best product. And I think, although graphics maybe don't matter from a buoy or two, they do matter. Like, it's important for you to, to believe what you have under your feet is the best in terms of materials or performance and that it's cool and it looks good. And as a product designer, like we kind of, we want to make not only a functional product, we want to make a beautiful product. I think that's kind of the, kind of the art and engineering that go together. And yeah, maybe for a tournament skier, that's not critical, but for, for a lot of us, it is important. Now at HO, like you have me there to safeguard that that performance isn't brought down by an aesthetic. Like we would never do that. But if we can make a super high performing ski and then in addition make it beautiful or, you know, I don't see any harm in that. I see only positive. And I think having that care, that attention to detail in all aspects of the ski, whether it's functional or aesthetic, it's just the way to do it. That's, that's how you make best product if, it's if important you, to us like john really cares about how that thing looks as much as will really cares about how it skis and having two guys both focused on making a great product coming at it from different ends of the spectrum is how you get an omega because it is a it is, john nailed it it's a beautiful ski and a timeless graphic yeah it's cool even if it's not critical but we have the budget to spend the money on that it doesn't that really is. cost that much more to make a nice graphic as opposed to a cheap looking graphic it just takes time and a willingness and the care to do it and you got to pay somebody like john yan to do it you know put yeah. it together we sit down and and john's been doing it a long time so he's made mistakes and learned and we understand what the market likes and we understand that we want to push it and so yeah that's what you get i think he did a great job tell me tell me uh just a first story that comes to mind where with all the way back to the beginning with Bob and Will and, and CP back in, you know, 12 years ago to now, like a yeah. moment that stands out. What's what's one moment where you're like, oh, shit, that was that was a close shave or that was luck that we stumbled on that or that was, you know, something just first thing that comes to mind with those guys. I think like getting getting Bob was was pretty cool and unique and lucky experience. So I don't even know if I should tell this story, but I will. <laughs> So we had, uh, I kind of told part before, we had, a, I always say like we had inherited a ski company 
because I went to, I got hired to work at HO, but um, a lot of the former group had left. Herb O'Brien had left, and Eddie Roberts had left, and Chris Sullivan had left, and they had built a, well, they had built the biggest key company in the world, market share leaders. And uh, they had started a new company, and so we, I, I had to kind of like, I, I wouldn't say fill those shoes, I don't think you can, but I had to run the company uh, from the ski side of the business, not the whole thing. But anyway, so I was very fortunate that Wade Cox stayed. And Wade is a legend. I mean, he was my hero growing up skiing. And um, he has a lot of influence and a lot of pull. And so the first thing we did, or I did, before I even went to Seattle, was I went to Orlando and we signed Will Asher. And that was a, one of the smartest things we ever did. He's an athlete you could build a brand around. And we have. And so, I mean, if without Wade, we probably wouldn't have Will Asher on the team, you know? So that's a that was a big standout moment, and I'm proud that he's still here all these years later. And to think of his career and where we've ended up, it's it's insane. But at the same time, Wade was very close with Chris Parrish, and Chris Parrish was you know coming off an 05 season, world records, and running four at 41 at the Masters. I mean, just unbelievable performances. And and Chris wanted to come ski for us, not because of this what we had at HO at the time, but because of what we could have had or what we were building, I should say. And so he came on, and um, he was skiing well, but he, he wasn't loving the Monza in all reality. I can say that now. It's a long time later. And so he said, I, I need some help. And he said, I've been working with Bob LaPointe a little bit. Bob helps me with my skis on my Sixums. And so you need to get him, get him to the factory. So uh, Bob showed up at the factory. I don't think I talked to him. Chris just arranged it. Bob showed up, and... He wanted to go in the mold, and he wanted to cut carbon and do some special layups and this and that. And I spent three or four days with him making skis, and he left, and Chris got on those skis, and then they were better. He was skiing better. He was kind of getting back to his old form like he was in the six sum. And then Bob came up again. And, and long story short, I mean, through those times of Bob coming in, him and I kind of fostered this relationship, and I convinced the ownership group to say, hey, you know, you just hired me. <laughs> to design skis for you, but I don't know what I'm doing. We need to hire LaPointe, which was a little risky at the time because it was kind of like, well, why do we need you? But we did need Bob. And and because of Chris, we got Bob, and Bob's been with us ever since. And that combination of myself and Bob, Chris at the time, and, and definitely Will the whole time, has really led us to where we are. you know. And it, it, it wouldn't have come unless we had Wade to get Will, and Wade to sign Chris, and Chris to convince me to hire Bob. And then really, the most important thing is like that whole team working together. Because when you got guys with that much experience, and they they have ego, and they're competitive, like it's a decision to cooperate or to fight. And those guys, we've never really had a fight. Like it was, it was pretty awesome. And I think that's what the result is of the skis you see today. Because I really feel like we're almost just hitting our stride. I know people say, oh, you know, can anything be done in skis? Is Everything's been done. Not even close. Like, I feel like HO is like, we've made some good skis in the last 10 years, 12 years, but we're kind of like really just hitting our stride. Like, we get it. We're, we're, we're piecing it together. I, I feel like that's a good point because if you tried to, pe if you tried to create a list, you're, st you're creating a team from scratch. Yeah. It'd be really hard to recreate just out of thin air what happened organically yeah you know and then to to think of that as as the backbone on which the last 12 years of 13 years have been built and like yeah. I, I was pulled into the fray by coxie yeah you know 2008 and, and really bob and bob bob sealed the deal i mean there's all i i respect on pretty much all the other brands and I, I respect like i was with denny for almost a decade yeah. On his skis. I love Denny's skis. Um, and Denny was great. He makes beautiful skis. He Den does. Denny makes great They're skis. They're really well made. Yeah. However, you know, at the time, you know, Denny's in Washington. We got some other folks that are local in Sacramento that are kind of helping run the company. But I never really had any support. I never really had anybody come to my lake and say, hey, try this or that. Like, it was always yeah. me going somewhere else. And when I wasn't even skiing for HO and... 
Wade was kind of peppering me like, hey, we got a new ski I'd love for you to try. Sure. I had a decent season in 08. Bob was like, hey, I'd like to come down and, and ski at your lake. Yeah. Bob's two hours away. It's two nice. and a half. But he made the trip for two days, came and rode in the boat, tweaked, tweaked things, did a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Next thing you know, I was like, this is it. It, it was the whole package. It wasn't yeah. how I felt on the water only. It wasn't how the ski looked only because it was badass. It yeah. wasn't just having Bob in the boat. It wasn't just having Wade reach out and continue to, to put energy into me. It was like this whole thing. And yeah. I feel like that's kind of what you just said in a nutshell. Try to. And, yeah. No, it's, that's it, though. That's that's the beauty <laughs> of the team. The team can be empowering when you have those kind of legends in your court or behind behind your back. Like It gives you an energy that you don't have if you're just solo. Yeah. You know, I remember... Uh, kind of related like a Chris uh the first nationals I won like I think it was 09 or something I was in a runoff in the final uh head-to-head -head runoff thing and Chris LaPointe came down to the dock with me when I was getting ready and just like told the boat to wait and got some time put your gloves on and like when you have a like a legend who's like got your back it just is empowering yeah and you can go out there and perform and and that's essentially what like the syndicate syndicate team's all about it works too I mean it's what you need you need that support system what how, how's it going so far here just like in your your take on... pretty pretty well i mean we do a lot of these testing sessions and sometimes a lot of like you work your ass off and not a lot comes out of it but i think yesterday we had like like i said we're kind of we're figuring some stuff out and we're finally we've worked really hard for 10 12 years and i think it's starting to pay off and we're kind of hitting our stride and i think you know breakthroughs are hard to come by but I think yesterday kind of was a breakthrough. You don't know until you look back and you say, well, that was the moment things changed a little bit. And to me, I saw some things when Will was skiing and when some of the other guys were skiing on one of our prototypes. And actually I went out and skied out and afterward and felt it. And I think it's kind of a new, it's what we've been looking for. It's something to build well, off of. One of the things we've been looking for. Yeah. Um, I had a thought, I just forgot it. <laughs> I heard my dog bark again. What the hell's going on mm -hmm. around here? We got to run a little tighter ship. Yeah. Get it um, together, MB. Oh, yeah. I, I got it. So sample sizes, because you and I are kind of, we're both engineers. We both understand the scientific process. We understand, like, number one, uh, true scientific test, people don't know what things are. And that's one of the things that we, we try to be good at is don't tell people this is soft, this is stiff, this has got yeah. this rocker, this, you know, bevel package, whatever. But also second part of that is our sample sizes are, are in the sport in general are pretty small meaning too small you can't go yeah. out and take 12 different sets on the same ski to get a, a sample size large enough to get an average outcome yeah you you really get only a couple sets and then you have to try something else because you only get so many sets period sure. as a skier so how do you how does that hinder us and how do we how do we or how do you guys as a team get over that hurdle of just the sample size beyond the whole thing of blind testing i think that's why the duration or how long it takes it takes so long to get to where we are now really putting it all together because it takes 10 years of skiing full on all the time with a with a pretty large group of people to even get the volume you need to test through some things because the water ski combinations are endless you know when you're talking rocker and shape and what I call cross sections like thickness, bevel size, concave entry, concave depth, then all the infinite fin possibilities, and then the different constructions and layups, and and then the human side of it as well. And you combine all those variables, it, it literally takes a career to to master it. And luckily, we had the opportunity to do that. And now you see, well, that, well, Bob's done it, so he's mastered what he knew for his time when he was skiing elite level and weight. I think. It's fair to say mastered it and i think will's kind of re reaching that master point so you get those three guys together and you've got a lot of wealth and knowledge but yeah it just takes a long time um a lot of sets and it is monotonous but when you're driven to figure it out that's and keeps you going for sure and these guys are to your point earlier i mean bob cares man he would he would drive two and a half hours down here from Chucky to ride in the boat and watch rob hazelwood try a different bevel package he still loves it. He's into it. He wants to figure it out. So that's the fuel that keeps it going, you know. It's pretty cool. It is. 
I was just sitting here at breakfast this morning, second day. Yeah. And you got, you know, Wade, Benny, CP, Mateo, Rob Hazelwood, yourself, Will Asher, you know, uh, Wade. My, my dad's sitting there talking to him. <laughs> yeah. My mom's there drinking coffee. Yeah. You know, Jenny's making breakfast. And it's just kind of, for me, it's like, this is crazy to have everybody here at my lake. Yeah. You know, doing this whole thing on the West Coast, kind of far removed from the epicenter, the Mecca of skiing, if you will, which is sure. Florida. Um, I feel like it's, we're kind of, we, we're becoming tighter as a crew just through the act of drinking coffees and having some yeah. breakfast and all being on on the same dock and having the dock be in the middle, middle of the lake instead of at the end. So everybody can see everybody else's ski and how it's riding, how it's performing and kind of that that blending of, of all these different characters into one, that synergy, I think is... Cool. It's pretty cool. I mean, they're our friends now. Like, we've gone on this journey together, and through that process, you know, you, you just form a bond. Like, it's more than business at this point. Like, we're, it's a, it's, it's like my friend group, right? Man, that's who we, that's our, that's our crew who we hang out with. And, and yeah, it's, it goes, I mean, we're all in search of the same thing. We love skiing, and we want to figure out how to make each other better. We want to figure out how to make better skis to help everybody. And, and enjoy the process and we've gotten pretty good at it both ends of it making a nice product getting along collectively and having fun and I, that's what's kept me at HL this long to be honest like because there's a lot of cool business opportunities in the world but it's hard to kind of like i really enjoy that camaraderie or that crew to work and ski with and it's it's cool it's cool to hang with those guys you know we don't think we have all the shit figured out though no like that that maybe that comes across like that sometimes, but like everybody else is pretty fucking good too. If you look at Radar and Good and D three and all the other brands, like everybody's trying their hardest for sure. Sure. I just I don't feel like we're we're any different or more special or whatever. I just feel like we have our own unique way of of trying to navigate what that means to develop the best tool so that everybody out there can jump on it and maybe get another buoy or two and sure. maybe make it a little easier on their body and a little more consistent. All, all that stuff. It's not like we're just like, oh, we got the fucking all the answers. No, it's like, no, no. We're trying. We're yeah. trying it our own way. Yeah. But, you know, come along for the ride and see see how we do it. And, and we are just kind of like one family, one group of friends. It's our interpretation you know? of, you know, what it should be. And like you said, there's a lot of good skis on the market. And I'm by no means I'm saying that we have it all figured out. We look at everybody, everyone skis and, and we look at, you know, old skis, new skis, the whole deal. I mean, I wouldn't say we're any better or any worse than anybody else, but I think we, we maybe put more energy and effort into it than some other brands in my experience. Like I have a little different perspective of water ski brands. Cause I don't only, not only see it from the external, but I, I see it from the internal as well. Like I've been, almost every ski factory out there and seeing the teams and the r d and all that and just the money spend um i know we spend a lot of money and we have a lot of effort and a lot of energy that goes into it whether it's my job to make sure that that's creating the best product and I, like i tell the guys I, I can't promise we'll always have the best water ski in the world but i promise we'll always be working our ass off to build it you know and i think a couple times in my career we've had the best water ski in the world there's been other times we haven't, but the years we had the best versus when we didn't wasn't a lack of effort or trying or focus. It was just hitting that magic combination of variables at that moment in time for that latest zero off iteration and skiers and timing and all that to, to have the one that people said, man, that, that's the best ski out there. Uh, and we're always striving for that for sure. So not to knock anybody else. I mean, a lot of well-made skis out there and I, I know those people are trying hard and we just have a little different approach and we have a kind of a cool approach like a, a more like generational approach and I don't know if it's better or worse but it's it's kind of a neat thing like in the history of water skiing to have this collective group of these individuals is rare maybe O'Brien had it back in the 80s or something you know like I see those posters on the wall I mean that would have been a cool team to be a part of you know i think maybe we have maybe the modern day version of that so it's 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 fun and hopefully we're doing our work and getting it right for you you know what i mean 
Yeah. So, I, I think what you just said sparked this idea that, in the in the course of working on this water ski documentary, I'm, I've kind of been working on loosely with some folks, you know, Trent and some other people throughout the last couple of years. Yeah. We've realized the history of the sport does not exist anywhere. In other words, there's there's no written, it's not written down. record. There's no websites. Yeah. There's no documentaries. There's no any fucking thing about the history of the sport. Starting from Ralph Samuelson almost 100 years ago to now, it's very pieced together. And sure. what is what is kind of special you just hit on about the team is that it is generational. Rob Hazelwood, Will Asher, and myself, you, and then Wade, and then Bob. Those are those four generations. Yeah. So for lack of a better term, we're like a living kind of – history piece as far as being able to kind of tie everything that was learned starting in the late sixties, early seventies with LaPointe all the way to now with Rob Hazelwood and, and, you know, Jamie Bull, you know, Allie Nicholson, Zane Nicholson, like we've, we've got, we've got that spread. And I think that's, that's valuable because it's unique um, and valuable. I I was just talking the other day, like for this documentary, I want to get, I want to sit with Rob Shirley. He's a legend. Yeah. Bob calls him the, the godfather of pro skiing. Because sure. he started the pro tour, I want to sit with with Eddie Roberts. Yeah. Because he was there at HL when I was there back as a kid. He just he, he's seen a lot and and he's he's hanging on. Yeah. And so there's these these people checkpoints along the way that um that have so much rich history and, and knowledge about the sport, and it's a shame that more of kind of what we have going doesn't exist. I would like to see the other brands, you know, build deeper. Because we, as a sport, we're all in it for the same reasons. We love it. It makes us feel more like a human. It makes us feel better about ourselves. It makes us feel better about those around us. Yeah. And uh, having that generation spread, I think, is key. I would say, like, why wouldn't you, right? Like, if it's an opportunity, why wouldn't you want to, like, learn from your elders in, in regards to skiing and life and things like that? So. And just how it was done. Like, just hearing stories from Bob and Wade about – how the past was, whether yeah. it was a pro tour past or it was ski development past or it was a commercial they shot. Yeah. You know, like just hearing about Some all good stories. Stuff. Yeah. What was it? What's the term? If you don't, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Something, something like, that. like that. Yeah. It's like that in a nutshell, I think is one of the biggest problems in our sport. And I feel like I feel proud to be part of a team that's got enough depth that we can learn from the past but also Bob and Wade are humble enough that they listen to the young guys. So, so we, we have a, we have a two way, we, I feel like we have a two way relationship with the past. We do. Yeah. We can capitalize on things they've learned or mistakes they've made in the past, but they're also can take their ego out of it and they'll let us go down a path. Even if they're like, man, I tried that in like 86 and it didn't go well. They'll still let us go. And then at the end when we're wrong (laughs) and they're usually like, yeah, I told you so. But every once in a while, you know, but they learn as they go as well. Yeah. Things have changed too. You know what I mean? Boats have changed radically and materials have changed radically. But there are certain fundamentals that never go away, you know. What else, dude? What else we got to talk about? Are you in charge. You antsy to get in the boat? We got. No, I'm enjoying it a little bit. <laughs> we were in the boat a lot yesterday. Yeah, we were in the boat all day yesterday. We've got like, my lake's like 100 feet that way. And everybody's out there skiing right now. It's a little chilly. It's a little chilly. I can't complain because it's nice compared to Seattle, but where you come I'm from, I'm gonna complain a little. Two days ago, yeah. three, three days ago it was 104. Two days ago it was 95. Yesterday it was 77. Today it's gonna be like 69, and it yeah. rained this morning. Feels like fall. I don't know what the hell's going on. I'm sorry. Water's nice. Water's warm. Water's still warm. Yeah. It takes longer to cool down. Mm-hmm. But how'd you feel yes- yesterday on the skis? It was cool. Like I rode a. Totally different ski than I would normally ride. A lot larger and different flex pattern. And you know, anytime you ride something that radically different, you're like, oh, it's kind of like, oh, here we go. What's going to feel like? But yeah. I was amazed how how good it felt. I mean, it wasn't definitely optimized for me. So, like, my buoy score wasn't where it could be. But I, I was telling my girlfriend, like, I thought it had really good feeling. Like, I think there's potential. There's something there. I'd really like to keep pursuing that path. I think that's a big thing for me as I've learned. It's like... I know it's a sport where you, you get an average score or you get a PB, but a lot of times that stuff's irrelevant um, when you're testing or trying to improve. And sometimes it's just like the feeling you have. I learned that from Will. Like you got to chase that feeling. If you get a good feeling, you go with it. And we, I had that. So I was, I was excited. I think a lot of the guys did. 
and then the scores will come when your confidence gets up and you really fine tune it and take it you know take like the point optimizes it for you that's how you get better yeah it's definitely about the feeling right i mean that's if why it, we do it if it doesn't feel right or enjoyable i just you're just hammering and it, it doesn't work well. At least it doesn't work well for me. For me, I got to like feel like, yeah, this is it. I like the feeling. I can achieve my what I'm trying to do on the water. And the confidence builds. And then you, you run buoys, you know. How has your approach or the team, this, this syndicate team in the last 10 years, how has, has the approach to what the actual goal is in ski design changed? In other words, you know, you and I have talked quite a bit about here's how you should ski. Fundamentally, here's the mechanics of how you should move your body, where your center mass should be. If you do that, here's a ski that'll work great. However, now we kind of realized, okay, maybe you got to build that ski for people who do move anatomically correct, you know, fun, from the fundamental physical yeah. standpoint. But also, what about folks who don't either have the, the, the assets to learn how, the, how to ski better, sure. but they just want a ski that performs better? Like, well, how do those... How are we reconciling those two? Or how are you reconciling those two as far as design direction? I think that's probably what we've learned in the last 10 years. Like, I think the first skis we made were, if I look back on them, were very much designed for people who ski in a more correct manner, I would say. Um, that's all we knew. You know, you, you, Wade and Bob and Will are, are like some of the best skiers of all time. And even the rest of us are pretty damn good so we ski we ski with fairly good technique uh and so the skis were very well suited to people who did the knock on the older ho skis was like yeah when i get to my hardest pass i can't get those last one two three buoys i can't scrap things like that so that was eye-opening to us you know because we could on those skis but i, I think the average people uh, couldn't so then we kind of delved into an area of like, okay, well, how do we make skis that help people ski more like Bob or Wade or Will? And I was big on that, like moving surface area around or doing bevel packages to push people up on the ski and to put them in the sweet spot. And and that worked okay. Um, but I think ultimately we had to realize like certain people, you know, eventually there's just certain people who don't have the opportunity to ski as much as we do or like you said, access to coaching who are probably never going to achieve those like ideal body positions. And, and can we make a piece of equipment that works well for them if they're not in, in the ideal position? And I think that's what we have now. Um, and then also the fusion of those three things. I think that's like kind of the, what I'm talking about is like when we're just hitting our stride. Cause now I feel like with certain skis, I can make skis that are optimized for, you know, ideal body position. But also if you're not in the in the correct position, they still work for you. Yeah. I think that's kind of like where we're at that point now. Before we could make ideal body position skis, we could make skis that worked if you weren't in the sweet spot. And now I can kind of like learning the balance of both. And the only way you do that isn't by thinking about or theorizing. It's just like cutting over a hundred ski molds in 10 years and doing these test sessions and grinding it out and, and getting through 10 years of iterative design process to kind of like get that touch or feel to where you're like getting that right combination of variables. It's a balance thing. And it's just like, it, it's, it's, you only gain it from experience. And so that's, that maybe is touches on what we have, you know, cause there's skis out there that are awesome for people who don't ski in the right, right position. And there's skis out there that are awesome for people who ski with perfect position. There's very few skis that combine that and they're kind of work on both ends of the spectrum. It's the biggest thing you've learned in the last two years. Anything as far as water ski related. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just like, even though we design skis and know the numbers in the CAD and have theories because we're engineers is to just listen to your athletes and to like quit thinking and talking so much and just listen to what Will says or what, Bob says or what Wade says because they're usually right that's what I've learned they might not articulate it perfectly and they might not use physics to explain it but their feel is unbelievable and what they're feeling is real and even more so than people understand and to just 
quit trying to argue with them about something or whatever and just listen and take it in because every set every pass there's a lesson to be learned you know and i really learned that in the last couple of years um just to shut up and listen to what they say because they're usually right i mean they're the astronauts at the forefront of the sport they're out pushing the limits of what's possible on a ski and their whole life is about riding that carbon wafer you know what i mean so they're totally invested so to ignore their nuanced feel would be absurd and i think there is a trend in the industry to say oh yeah that's just that's oh he's he can ski on anything or you know he, he's such a unique case no nah, not really i mean they yeah they can ski on almost anything but their their feel is like tuned into a new level and just listen to that and then try and work with them to build off of it and that, that's helped me a lot so that's killer I yeah guess it's like it... the longer you do it the less you know the more you listen you know like anyone who says they got it all figured out that's suspect <laughs> You know, yeah, that humility piece. It's it, it. You want to be like, oh, we're at the top of the hill. I don't know if you're ever going to be at the top of the hill. No, I was telling someone the other day. It's like I feel like you're always striving to be at the top of the hill, and you never feel like you're there. But then maybe when you look back ten years later, you'll be like, oh yeah, I think we were there. You know, like like A one or something. Like I never felt like we had the best ski in the world at that time. To be honest, I I saw the issues with it and the problems and this and that. But now you look back ten years and you're like, yeah, we probably did. That was the best ski in the world at that time. You know, I, most people would say. I still, I, I know you don't agree. I still think it's one of the best skis, even today. I mean, it's okay. This year, <laughs> oh, come on, man. <laughs> I just started skiing thirty six again this year, and and. I wanted to be on something that I knew. Sure. And that's kind of what I stopped skiing my career on in 2011. I was still kind of on some form of that. Sure. And so I, I just started the year out on that. Sure. And it felt... It's a good ski. It felt great. It's a good ski. And then you're like, hey, I'm going to send you a 67 Omega. Yeah. I think you might like it. Give it a go. Took my, my crap off my A1. <laughs> yeah. Put it on the Omega and got my fin how how I want it. And I've been loving it. Like, I know I'm only skiing 32 off at 36, but it feels so similar in so many ways. However, it feels like I can control a little bit more, mm -hmm. and it's a little more predictable, and it actually turns a little tighter because yeah. the A1 kind of ran on people. Yeah, it ran did. on me. Yeah. And I could deal with it, but now I can feel that 10 years of, of, of R&D coming back around full circle. That's what it is, yeah. And I, I, can, I can't articulate... The differences, necessarily, I can just feel that evolution. It's it's more refined, and it, the the mega feels like like what I wish the A one would have felt like when I was trying to run buoys and run yeah. forty one off. I mean, A one was all we knew at that time. It was putting our best foot forward, and it had flaws and weaknesses, and you know, and then you go, you you hammer at it for ten years, and essentially Omega kind of has that H O A one feel. But because of all those journeys we took in between then and now, it has, it's more refined and also has ability to do things that A1 couldn't do. And had we not gone on that journey in between, you don't, you don't have the, the learnings and the mistakes and the successes that add up to that Omega. And that's kind of what I was alluding to, like putting in that effort. Because we very easily could have taken an A1 and just iterated the design a little bit every year for a decade. And honestly, we probably would have sold just as many skis. But the team wasn't satisfied with that. And they wanted to figure it out. And on that figuring it out, that journey, that tree with all these different branches that broke off it, we had some successes, we had some failures, we learned from all of them. But I don't think you would have a ski like Omega had you not gone on that journey. If you would have played it safe, and just iterate a little bit off the best ski in the world at the time, it would have been a lot of business. Would have made a lot of business sense. But we we didn't take that path. We risked a little bit more, and we learned a lot. And I feel like that's why now, through that process, we've learned so much that we're we're just hitting our stride. Yeah, I think for me, what you just said resonates yeah. in the sense that everything we do in life pretty much is some form of a game. Not that it's like trivial. You know, like it's sure. Doesn't oh, it matter, matters. But it's yeah. like 
they're games that we play and there are rules to the game and i feel like if we would have just taken a1 and just iterated to play the game of can we sell more skis can we continue to to hold market share is that our end goal is to just sell skis we could have just reskinned and refined which is what that's done that's that's happening that's already in the industry yeah. but the game that that you and Will Asher and Bob and Wade they've they already played that game too i think that's where the experience that's one of the ways that yeah. that experience comes in is they're like look we can play that game but they're more interested in the game of can we develop the best ski that's going to allow any skier who jumps on it to get more buoys because that game is more important to the skier than the game of a company selling more skis agreed i, I feel like that's the game that you guys are are currently involved in and it's just it's fun to be a part of that for sure it is i think that's why everybody's here had we taken step one of iterating from where from what we had you wouldn't have this group of people you wouldn't have attracted benny you wouldn't have attracted a mateo those guys are they they are hungry to figure it out and they're great skiers they could ski for anyway but they ski for us because because of that yeah you know sweet that's fun dude it's cool we gotta do this more i'll bring the motorhome up to seattle maybe come on we could we could park it on your uh on your front driveway like <laughs> yeah. this popping a popping a wheelie that'd be great my neighbors would love it uh-huh you probably would. only get like six or seven tickets I, <laughs> <laughs> my ass would be like 20 feet into the oh, road totally they're so uptight about that in kirkland so it, they, they run a tight ship yeah why why pacific northwest i mean no i, I need to go my ca my camera batteries need recharge why are this why are yeah. all the ski companies why there? the fuck is every ski company starting why is it starting in pacific northwest i really don't know that I, I mean, I'm not besides from the, there. Besides the Boeing thing. Yeah, people say that. I don't know. Uh, Herb was from there, uh, which led to, like, you know, Jeff Joby was his neighbor and his friend, I've heard. Bob knows better than I. I asked him the full story. That's we'll get, where Joby we'll came from. And I don't know if it's just a coincidence that Pat Conley was from there. But Herb started a couple companies, you know, three companies. And I think it just... I mean, it wasn't. I, I think, really, there was a lot of California companies. There were Florida companies. Why did the ones in the Pacific Northwest make it? Maybe because they had a lot of engineers there at Boeing who were using fiberglass. Because pre-fiberglass, there were a lot of wood skis made elsewhere. Like Bob Maha in California or maybe Cypress Gardens. Were they in Florida? I don't know. Yeah. The, gotta ask LaPointe. Yeah. But... We'll ask him. Yeah. There is a culture. There is a pretty deep-rooted culture of water skiing in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's not a ton of lakes, but there are some big ones. And people love it. And there is that history. So it kind of fuels itself. Um, but yeah, that's... what's your message for like 90% of skiers out there, the ball of sprayers, the amateur skiers the you know, the, the aspiring masters, men's big dog skiers, the juniors, like what's my message? Yeah. Just what the hell, what do you, what are you trying to do? I well, would say as the leader of the, of one of the biggest ski companies in the world, what, what's your goal and how do they fit into that picture? Well, I would want them to know that. You know, we really care about skiing and we're really working hard to make them the best thing they can put under their feet. It is a business. I am responsible for like keeping the doors open, the lights on, but it's more of a passion project for us. HO would be just fine if we didn't sell water skis, put it that way. It's a weird thing to think about. We have enough money coming in, in other areas that we don't have to do it. And it isn't like setting the world on fire. You know, we do well, but we're doing it because we want to. And we put a lot of time and effort and energy and passion into it. So give our skis a shot, man. Like, I really wish more people used our demo program or rode their buddies' skis or got them under their feet. Because what I found is most people who try our skis really like them. And for the majority of people who aren't riding them, it's because they've never tried them. So really, like, take advantage of the demo program and get on our website log in we send you a ski for three weeks for like 50 bucks and you can ride it at your lake behind your boat with your driver and put it through the paces and ride it like you stole it and if you like it at the end you keep it if you don't like it you send it back and it costs you 50 dollars. i mean i would be all over that if i was on the customer side of the thing we do it for our hard shell boot as well um so yeah i would say like and kind of tied into that like the thing i've learned working with these guys the last couple years is like if you want to get better at skiing, 
you need to try new things. You need to try new techniques. You need to try new equipment. You can totally unravel trying too many things, but you got to try different stuff if you want to improve. And you cannot be afraid. And I feel like a lot of people at high level skiing are pretty uptight on their equipment and their technique and the way they do it. And, you know, uh, the best skiers in the world aren't. Will Asher, although he seems all buttoned up, is fearless when it comes to trying new ways of skiing and trying new technique. And I believe that's why he's as successful as he is. I don't think that's been a hindrance. And I've learned that, to be fearless and try new things. And it has not hurt me. It has helped me immensely. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Well, we, we know, like we've talked about, you and I have talked about, trying a, a rear toe a rear kicker or a different boot in the back and then how when you go back to your normal setup you, you can feel more good yeah. or good or bad um and, and as re with regard to willie like i sat down with him in the motorhome after diablo uh, or cali pro am sure the week before malibu where he ended up yeah i watched the interview rushing 41 in the head-to-head -head yeah. when it really counted one of the best 41s i've, I've seen yeah he nailed um, it yeah to beat nate yeah and it's funny because I was thinking back to the interview and I was like, what are you going to do this week? And he said, I'll probably go home and try a couple different things. And then if nothing works, you know, better, I'll get back on my old ski, yeah. or my, my baseline ski Thursday and go to the tournament Friday. And that's, it's some, something's working. And he, like you said, he is fearless with regards to trying to find the boundaries yeah. because at the boundaries, at the, at the tails of the distrib the bell, bell curve distribution lies the most opportunity. Yeah, I, I watched that interview and I heard him say that. And I was sitting there on my couch thinking, wow, the majority of people are going to think he's sabotaging himself. That's what I thought. Because, you know, I exist in this world. We live in ski world. So, and then to see him come back the next weekend and crush 41, I was just like, yeah, dude. Like, hopefully that some people who paid attention to that it woke him up a little. Because, man, if you're riding the same ski you did five years ago, working on the same keys, you're probably going to get the same score or within a buoy or two. And if you're cool with that, that's good. But I'm not cool with that. And these guys aren't. And they're they're riding some radical stuff this weekend, trying to figure it out. And here they are, the best skiers in the world, and they're making like technique moves that are big changes. And they're falling. And they're having successes. And they're learning. And that process is why these guys are where they at or are or where they're at now and what will take them to the next level. That's my advice. You know, like it's pretty easy to get uptight in the slalom course. It's the same thing. It's super repetitive. We all know there's a, like a fluctuation around your average score that if you're off by one buoy or when you come in a four ball, you wheelie instead of nail it, you're like week is ruined or your day is are, are ruined until your next set, until you get back to your average. Yeah. Let it go, man. Like yeah. you, that's my advice. And I know that because I've made those mistakes, yeah. you know. You're, you're one of us. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah. You're stuck in the cycle. Totally. Spin cycle. It's good though. But in order to get out of the cycle, you got to look to the guys who are who have gotten out of it at least momentarily and uh that's what they're doing yeah. they're trying different stuff they're trying new ways new combinations and uh if you manage that process well you will see improvement it's inevitable dude thanks for taking the time to sit down yeah it's fun i always enjoy it yeah i, th I think we got to cut it off because we got to get more people in here too long no it's good it's great. And it's you can just edit long. it into these little bite-sized things no, to make us sound intelligent. <laughs> I'm just going to let it run and see what people think. Sure. Cool. But uh, yeah. All right, I'm going to go ski. Get your ass out there. Take right. some sets. Freeze your butt off. No, Actually, the sun's good. coming out. I think it's going to be good. That's my move. Yeah, That's the secret till, move. Wait till the sun comes out. You're the like, boss. You can do that. You can do whatever. Yeah. So yeah, in the morning, you're like, oh, I got to work. I got to yeah. ride. And then around 3.30 when it's about max heat, yep. sun's high, you're like, yep. Well, I better try that ski now. <laughs> yeah. You're like, which, which, which one should I try? That's the, okay. other, that's the other move. That's a good lesson. Yeah. You let them ride all the stuff. Yeah. And then whatever seems to be working, yep. you just pace yourself and then you, you just skip steps one through five and yep. go on. It's pretty, it's good. Seniority rules, right? I mean, we're-, we're I'm not almost, the oldest. No, but you're closer. So you get to make those- You're th closer to the oldest. Fuck, I know. I did that yesterday. I waited till the end of the day and I tried. Yeah. I tried something. We waited too long though. We had glare. Ah, it wasn't that bad. No, the ridge is great. There's we, no glare. Well, there is glare this time of year, but yeah. every other time of the year, spring, summer, and early fall, it's pretty good. Yeah. I'm not complaining. It was my built-in excuse. Yeah. So. What do you think about the ridge, though, before we, we leave? She like, looks different. 
She lo- she looks different. The lake looks different. The the grounds look the a little tules different. The tulies are not so tight. Is that what yeah. you guys call them here? Yeah, tulies, reeds. Cattails in yeah. the Midwest. If if I would have thought like even a year ago that I could host like 10 of you guys on the premises, cool. and everybody had their own bed, and we could feed everybody in the morning and, and yeah. for lunch, and we could get all the ski rides we need at you one You should place. do like a pancake breakfast for everybody here. Yeah. Like bring in all the... Okay. A regatta syndicate yeah. at, uh, skiers. H.O. I'll flip regatta. pancakes. All right. On your griddle. I got a left-handed spatula. Yeah, I need that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. We should do that. Let's let's plan that. All for right. Next I'm year. putting it out there into the Pan- pancake Insta breakfast webs. at the ridge. Well, yeah. well, this is kind of the the pilot for me, and it, it seems like everybody's doing okay. Like nobody's got sore backs from any of the shitty beds they're having to sleep in. So. Well, you got like a full on workout facility got here the gym on, too. on. Yeah, I mean, so if you're Sore, you can hang upside down or you can. Yeah. Gym, breakfasts, ski lake. Drinks, ski lake. You're good. Yeah. All right. Everybody's welcome. Yeah. (laughs) We'll put it out there. Not everybody's welcome. Well, you have to sign up. You have to pass a a test, initial survey. Cool. Thanks, buddy. I'm done. I'm out. Cool.